I'm Lee C. Camp, and this is No Small Endeavor, exploring what it means to live a good life. In the context of stress, and, you know, basically in the context of life, negative emotions are normal. That's Judith Moskowitz, a social psychologist at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. More specifically, she studies the impact of positive emotion in the context of intensely difficult life circumstances. You don't want to deny or suppress your negative emotions. But even in the midst of really extreme stress, people can experience positive emotions. And these positive emotions and positive events seem to be helping them cope better with this extreme form of stress. She relays some groundbreaking research in the field of social psychology and offers some helpful tools and practices for increasing one's positive emotion in the midst of acute stress. All coming right up. Hey, friend, if you didn't know, I started a newsletter a while back that comes out every two weeks. I've been delighted to hear from so many of you about positive response to the newsletter. We call it the No Small Endeavor Notebook, where I riff on themes and topics related to our podcast, giving you additional material for thinking and doing in your own quest to make sense of what it might mean to live a good life. Join us by going now to nosmallendeavor.com and sign up there. Again, go to nosmallendeavor.com to sign up now for our free No Small Endeavor Notebook newsletter. I'm Lisey Camp. This is No Small Endeavor, exploring what it means to live a good life. Stress, we're told, can be a silent killer, and it sometimes appears that our entire economy and social structure are oriented toward increasing our stress levels. Then add the challenges of major life events, a death of a loved one, losing a job, friends moving away, applying for college, a divorce, and a sense of overwhelming stress seems sooner or later to come for us all. Our guest today, a social psychologist and professor at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, has dedicated her research career to studying the ways individuals under acute stress have navigated that stress. She particularly examines the ways in which so-called positive emotion provides much-needed resources for navigating those occasions of acute stress, and she's developed practical direction on the ways one can cultivate those so-called positive emotions. And heads up, this is not a naive, positive-thinking pep rally approach, but a nuanced, multifaceted conversation about the way we humans work and the nature, goods, and ills of our emotional tapestry. Judith Moskowitz is Professor of Medical Social Sciences at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She's a social psychologist, having completed her PhD at Dartmouth. She studies the impact of positive emotion on adjustment to health-related and other life stress, She's also a principal investigator of several NIH-funded trials of an intervention designed to increase positive emotion and improve psychological and physical well-being in people experiencing various types of life stress. And she's welcomed me to her office here on Michigan Avenue, downtown Chicago, with spectacular views of Lake Michigan. Welcome to the show, Judy. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the most beautiful day we've had so far it's in pretty, Chicago I, this year. I brought good weather from Tennessee. You did. Thank you so much. So first, let me ask about your field or the name of your department, Medical Social Sciences. So for those who might not know what medical social sciences are, describe this sort of multidisciplinary endeavor for us. Yeah, so we are a department of behavioral and social scientists doing work in the medical and health field. So psychologists, sociologists, epidemiologists. We have a big group doing measurement development to assess patient reported outcomes in the health field. So it is, it's, as you said, multidisciplinary and mostly focused on health and health care. Yeah. So describe for us how your field relates to the development of positive psychology. So my work started in this in this area of trying to understand positive emotion in the midst of stress and trying to help people have more positive emotions so they can cope better with stress. This started in the early to mid 1990s about the time that positive psychology was sort of coming online and and Martin Seligman started that 
area of psychology. And what I was studying at the time was men caring for their partners with AIDS. So some of the most extreme stress you can imagine experiencing. This was before the more effective medications for AIDS and HIV. So AIDS is essentially a terminal illness. So the, the men in our study were caring for a partner who was dying. And then we also continued to interview them after the death of the partner. Mm. So the stress of caregiving and the stress of bereavement. Mm. And initially we were asking questions about that stress, really looking at, you know, how do people cope well with extreme stress and what can they do to cope better with that extreme stress? So asking them what was stressful about caring for your partner or bereavement in the past week, what was a stressful event that happened for you, and then how did you cope with it? And then that was the end of the interview. And we said, thanks, we'll see you again in two months. They were interviewed every two months. And shortly after the start of the study, the participants said, well, you're not asking us about the good things that are happening in mm -hmm. our lives. And we were shocked as stress and coping researchers because we were studying stress. And what, why would we ask about good things? Because, of course, they didn't have any good things going on because yeah. their partner was dying. But they convinced us. And the, the principal investigator on that study, Susan Folkman, is a very wise woman. And she listened to our participants. So we added a question to the end of the interview following the, you know, tell us something stressful that happened in the past week and what did you do in response? We then asked about something positive and meaningful that happened in the past week that helped you get through a day. And in almost every single interview after that, even if their partner had just died, the participants were able to talk about something positive that mm -hmm. happened. So it was a real eye-opener for us to see that, oh, even in the midst of really extreme stress, people can experience positive things and positive emotions. And these positive emotions and positive events seem to be helping them cope better with this extreme form of stress. And then in time, you all began to ask about how those sorts of positive experiences can be multiplied or even uh, learned? Yes. So after after that study and another study or two and other things were starting to come out in the literature, including positive psychology that was starting to look at these things, we were able to see that it wasn't that unusual for people experiencing various types of extreme stress to also have positive emotions. Absolutely, there were there was sadness and depression and anxiety when people are experiencing stress, but there was also happiness and satisfaction and yeah. relief and contentment. So at that point, I started asking myself whether it would be possible to teach people how to experience more positive emotion, even if they were experiencing stress. So we put together a multi-component program and started testing that in various groups. Usually it was health-related stress, and now we've expanded into all kinds of life stress where we can look at whether practicing these skills is helpful in maintaining well-being. Yeah, that raises loads of questions. But before we go into those, let me go back to the question about positive psychology just a moment. So of, of, as, as I understand the discipline of positive psychology, Seligman is, as a practitioner, helping people with various forms of dysfunction. And as I heard him say in one lecture, he realized that he could help his patients not be depressed, but once they're not depressed, that doesn't make, their, make them happy or it doesn't help them thrive. And so then he begins to ask the question, can psychologists identify ways of living that facilitate flourishing, not just help them overcome dysfunction? So your, your work seems to fit squarely in, in that sort of relatively new tradition in psychology. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And what was really groundbreaking about what he did by promoting this idea that just because you're not depressed doesn't mean that you're doing great, right? That separation of negative emotions and experiences from positive and that the idea that you can experience both, where we've taken it from there is that we're very clear when we're teaching these skills, again, usually to people experiencing pretty extreme stress, we are clear that in the context of stress, 
and, you know, basically in the context of life, negative emotions are normal and expected. They give you information. They're important. You don't want to deny or suppress your negative emotions. That said, what we learned from the caregivers and in studies since then is that even though you're having negative experiences and the negative emotions that go along with it, you can also experience positive emotions as well. And the more you can experience those positive emotions, the better off you'll be and the better you will be able to cope with that stress. Yeah. So before we look at the positive emotions more, let's talk about the negative a bit more um, because it seems like negative, what we call, and I'll come to asking what we mean by negative in a moment as well. But when we talk about negative emotions, they seem to get such a bad rap. But I hear you saying they have their place and they're important. I think you just said they're important forms of information to us. So unpack that a little bit more for us. So humans have evolved to pay attention to the things that are dangerous to them, Mm. right? So, you know, going back to you see a bear, (laughs) you see a tiger running at you, a negative emotion will tell you that's bad for me and I need to respond, right? Our whole physiological stress response is built around this concept that when something bad, something threatening, the stress response then helps you become physiologically ready to flee, to run, to fight, to sometimes it's freezing in fear. But it's a long evolved process that has helped humans (laughs) stay alive, right? So it's really important. The problem becomes that in modern life, you know, not many of us are facing tigers in our day-to-day life. Not many of us are facing that kind of life-threatening situation that our negative emotions may be signaling to us. So that's where it has sort of gone awry and that our negative emotions now point us to what is maybe going wrong. Like there's there's a lot of traffic, so I've got a negative yeah. <laughs> emotion. This is threatening to me, for example, just as a random example, yeah, not yeah, that yeah. you know anything yes, about no, that. No. Yeah, so the negative emotions are important to help us identify what's going wrong yeah. and where we need to make a change, right? Right. So this whole notion of being able to hold the positive alongside the negative seems immensely helpful to me at a practical level. And for me as someone who has done a fair amount of work and even learning to pay attention to myself emotionally, so I'm I'm flashing back to years ago being in a therapist's office and he asked me, what are you feeling? And I, I said, I don't know. And, and he kind of chuckled and he said, I think you're telling the truth because I, I really didn't know what I was feeling, you know. And so having to learn that and at about the same time, I was in a, another group with, with some guys who are good friends of mine now because we've been doing stuff together for years on Saturday mornings. And one of the guys in this group said that he had recently been to an art museum. I can't remember if it was here in Chicago or New York. And he came upon this painting that was just white on white. And he said, he said, when I started doing the work I'm doing, he said, this was like what my emotional tapestry was like. It was just blank, right? And he said, then I went a little further in the museum and I saw a white canvas that had a big, bright, red blotch of, of color. And he said, that was like the next phase where I couldn't identify anything except anger. I just knew I was angry. And then he said, then I went on to see a Jackson Pollock painting that was just a, a flash of all sorts of beautiful colors. And, it, and he said, I, I began to realize this is what my emotional experience can be like on a daily basis. I can have a little dash of red, but I've got the blues and the greens and the yellows and this beautiful tapestry of all sorts of emotions. And that was just so helpful to me. But it was like I can carry all of these things with me on a daily basis, hourly basis, and that be OK. And not only OK, but it enriches my life. I don't know. Commentary on that. It's it's such a beautiful way to describe it. And. Originally, when we were starting to teach the skills to various groups, we just dove right in and we're like, here's what positive emotion is, and here are things you can do to have more positive emotion. And we realized that we needed to take a step back and talk about emotions. 
huh. positive and negative emotions and help them understand the sort of rich tapestry, like yeah. you said, of emotions and the different nuances of emotions before we dove right into talking about positive emotions. Because there are a lot of people, often men, but not exclusively, who can't name their emotions. And when they might try to learn some skills for having more positive emotion, that doesn't make any sense to them because they can't differentiate their emotions beyond, you know, how are you? I'm okay. Yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> like there's no there's no diversity of emotions right. in their experience. And so we try to help people learn that how to how to be aware of their emotions and how to label them. Yeah. So let me ask a, a dig into that question about your comment about mostly men, but not just men. So obviously we're we're beginning to wade into perhaps fraught waters of ginger essentialism <laughs> and things of that sort. But let me yes. but let's ask some questions yeah. about that. So is there data showing that men have more trouble with that, or is that kind of anecdotal in your experience? It is both of those things. Okay. So definitely anecdotal in my experience in teaching this program, men have a harder time labeling what they feel, or at least maybe they can label it in their heads, but they aren't yeah. uh, as adept at expressing what they feel. And I don't have the studies on the tip of my tongue, but... Yeah. I would bet good money that there's a lot of literature that yeah. men are not as emotionally diverse <laughs> in their experience <laughs> and expression as women are. And do you think that that is something particular to American culture, Western culture, or do you think that's more universal? Oh, that's a great question. Emotions are very culturally bound and swayed by the values of the culture that you're in. It's one of the reasons that when I'm approached by a colleague who wants to do this work internationally, they say, I want to, so true example, I have a colleague who has convinced me to write a grant to deliver this program to men in Bangkok. And my first response was, absolutely not. Like Mm. this, the program would need to be completely different the values that people living in Thailand, so more, you know, Eastern Eastern yeah. Asian cultures, the value that they place on positive emotion in particular is different. Their culture is much more communal and not as individual. And this this program, my program, has been developed in the United States and is very culturally bound to the American way of individualism. Yeah. And it's very focused on the individual, which is not a bad thing, but it's a cultural things. So I think it's possible to translate this program and these ideas of emotional awareness and emotional value to other cultures so that it can be beneficial to other cultures. But I am very careful not to just assume that the program that I've developed in the U.S. can be translated into a different culture. You're listening to No Small Endeavor and our conversation with Judith Moskowitz, professor at Northwestern School of Medicine, discussing her research on positive emotion. I love hearing from you. Tell us what you're reading, who you're paying attention to, or send us feedback about today's episode. You can reach me at lee at nosmallendeavor.com. You can get show notes for this episode in your podcast app or wherever you listen. These notes include links to resources mentioned in this episode, as well as a PDF of my complete interview notes, which sometimes includes material not found in the episode. And you can also there find a link to a full transcript. Coming up, Judith and I discuss toxic positivity, what is meant by positive or negative emotion, and the practicalities and practices for facilitating constructive positive emotions. Hey, friends, Lee Seacamp of No Small Endeavor here. Hey, would you like to expand the community of people talking about the things you like to talk about? Here is an easy way to do that. And we, I would be most grateful if you were to do so. Go over to your favorite podcast listening app, click on Reviews, and leave No Small Endeavor a glowing five-star review. Tell folks, perhaps, 
about some episode you liked in particular, and tell folks what you like generally about No Small Endeavor. The topics, the dashingly handsome articulate host, or whatever it is that floats your boat. That will help more people find us, which will expand the community of people talking about the things you like to talk about, especially when you make it one of those five-star reviews. Thanks. I'm David Remnick, and each week on the New Yorker Radio Hour, my colleagues and I unpack what's happening in a very complicated world. You'll hear from the New Yorker's award-winning reporters and thinkers, Jelani Cobb on race and justice, Jill Lepore on American history, Vincent Cunningham and Gia Tolentino on culture, Bill McKibben on climate change, and many more. To get the context behind events in the news, listen to the New Yorker Radio Hour wherever you get your podcasts. We've been using the language of positive and negative a lot already without Mm -hmm. defining those. And I think intuitively, or we would suspect that intuitively we know what that means. But from a scientific, neurological, brain science perspective, social psychology perspective, are there definitions for that? We don't use positive in the term in the sense that positive is good, like yeah. Positive emotions, these are the good emotions to have. That's not a value judgment, it's a it's a valence. So from sort of positively toned things like happiness and joy yeah. and you know the gratitude for ex- you know those more positively toned versus the negatively toned emotions which are sadness and fear for example. Yeah. So it's really about the sort of valence uh-huh. and then to some extent the arousal level of the emotion. So you can have really high arousal emotions, like excitement, high arousal positive is excitement and enthusiasm. And I'm gesturing this sort of high level, which you can't see, um, (laughs) up with my hand. And then lower valence positive emotions are things like calm and contentment and satisfaction. And the emotions range all along that activation or arousal continuum, yeah. as well as the valence from positive to negative. Yeah. So let me ask about, step back to the language of stress and ask about good stress and bad stress, uh, which I think is a different use of good and bad. As I understand it, at least, there are forms of stress that are good for us in the sense that they facilitate certain forms of productivity or fruitfulness, perhaps, and bad stress that leads to dysfunction or inability to to do well. I don't know, commentary on that or you yeah, being a so stress I think researcher, it, it how do you think about there it? There are definitely individual differences on this. So what might be sort of a motivating kind of stressful thing to me might be either not show up for you at all or yeah. be completely devastating, yeah. right? So there's a lot of individual variability in that. Yeah. But I think your your basic point that stress isn't always horrific stress yeah. or you know overwhelming stress the official definition of stress is the perception that the thing that's happening exceeds your ability or resources to cope with it yeah so back to positive emotion negative emotion i can't cite the researchers but i recently heard of a study in which they identified a certain ratio so that so they were also saying the point is not to get rid of negative emotions but that there's an identifiable ratio of the positive to the negative and i i think it was 2.97 and they rounded it up to three or something like that Uh, any reflections on that or commentary on that yeah so that research does exist there were a few papers that came out that showed that this was sort of the optimal ratio of emotional experience of positive to negative There have been some questions raised about some of that work and how they quantified emotions. And practically speaking, how would you go about figuring out what that looks like in your day-to-day life? (laughs) Like, okay, I've had three things happen today. Two of them were bad and one was good, so I'm off. I need another, you know. Yeah. It's a useful sort of metric to think about in research and to, you can look in data sets of people who uh, on their daily emotion ratios and you could look to see are the people who are 
three to one or 2.9 to one, yeah. are they better off on some outcome than the people who have a different ratio? But practically, I'm not sure how helpful it is. Yeah. I, I think what, after I had heard that and was reflecting on it some, I did ask myself that same sort of question of, well, how in the world am I supposed to quantify this? But at the same time, it did help me Again, it was another way, just like the notion of the the Jackson Pollock picture I was talking about earlier, that research helped me remember again that just because something even sharply negative happens in a given day, it doesn't have to mean that is the lens through which the whole of the day is understood and that there are still ways in which I can embrace the gifts and the goods and the blessings of that day and, and always hold those things together. Right. And it's, the goal isn't to have no ma- negative emotions. You don't want to be at a zero. Yeah. Because, you know, like I said, negative emotions give you information. And they also add to the richness of your life. Yeah. So if they're, they're not so high and overtaking the positive emotions, it's good to have that, again, the diversity of emotions yeah. in your life. This, this uh, whoever was reporting, the secondary re- source that was reporting on that study uh, also talked about some research that indicated there's a, a, a ratio at which there can be too much positivity. Uh, and I, I think, I don't know, the ratio was 18 or 20 to one or something like that. But it kind of it kind of makes me a little anxious just thinking about being around someone who's that positive, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, I, you know, in our research, when we're recruiting people to be in our studies, early on, I would exclude people who had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So they may have been more likely to have manic episodes, right? Because my thinking as a non-clinician was that, well, maybe there are some people who shouldn't be working to have more positive emotion. I shouldn't be teaching them skills to have more positive yeah. emotion. What if it triggers a manic episode? Yeah. I've since you know, learned through colleagues who are experts in bipolar disorder, Sherry Johnson at, at Berkeley. And she said, the key is that you need to... to educate the participants on what kind of positive emotions. So mm. we would we need to focus on the lower activation, sort of calm type of positive emotions versus being like, any positive emotions are good, which may lead some people to go for the really high activation, manic, yeah. <laughs> consistent positive emotions. So I hadn't heard the whatever 18 to 1 ratio that yeah. is the tipping point. But I think that's true that you you wouldn't want to be exclusively yeah. in a positive state all the time. At least the notion, I don't know if you've used the, this phrase in this interview, but the, the notion of toxic positivity, it's, it's helpful to know there, that there is such a thing. Yes, yeah. And we're always very intentional when we're teaching these skills to be clear that negative emotions are normal and functional and they full of information that's useful. So we're not saying deny your negative emotions, suppress them. I think the the idea of toxic positivity is that then you feel like it's demanded of you. Mm, <laughs> you yeah. must be positive all the time, highly positive. Yeah. Don't show any negative emotions. And that is absolutely not the case. Yeah. That's not adaptive at all. So uh, the last kind of broader cultural question and this is just a slightly different angle on things that we've already discussed. But, you know, I've read studies where people making the argument, I don't know if these were essays or research studies, but people making the argument that there's a sort of perhaps toxic optimism among some segments of American culture that refuse to look at very serious social I- ills, for example, climate change hostility in politics, whatever the case may be, yeah. that there's a sort of toxic optimism. If it, we'll just think positively about this, it will be okay. Any commentary on that? Right. That is a bad thing, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I would never want people to, again, that gets into the denial yeah. and the pretending like the negative isn't there and just, you know, sticking your head in the sand. And often when we're we're teaching these skills to various groups, we get the question about, well, there are systemic problems in this world or, you know, in healthcare or in our justice system. 
why would I want to make my outrage over that go away, mm -hmm. right? right? Then you won't do anything. So again, that's why we say you keep the negative emotions. The positive emotions help you sort of stay in the game yeah. and and fight against the injustices and the oppressions in the world. Yeah, yeah. So let's shift then to the question of particular positive emotion interventions or skills that you're teaching, that you've been studying and that you're teaching. What are some that you all have been paying a special attention to? Special attention to. So we have usually eight to 10 skills. And the idea behind it is that, you know, you don't have to do them all. <laughs> it's not like there's some magical synergistic package, but that we we ask our participants to try each one. Just try it. You might first think, no, I'm I I've got that one, or I don't want to do that, or that sounds terrible. We ask everyone to try each of the skills and see what works for them and then make that one a habit, right? So the skills include things like noticing positive events, which you know, especially when you're under stress can be really hard. So yeah. you think about the the caregivers that I talked about earlier in this sort of really extreme stressful situation. Those who were able to notice a positive event, a lovely sunset, a beautiful flower, a walk on the beach, and good meal for their partner did better. So we try to help people realize that, you know, no matter how bleak things are, there's always something positive. So, you know, look for it and notice it. And once you start trying to notice the positive things, you start noticing more of them. Yeah. So noticing positive events is usually where we start the program because that's sort of a easy entry. Yeah. And then related to that is savoring those events or we sometimes call it amplifying or capitalizing on those events. And this is telling someone about it or even thinking about it later on or writing it in your journal or putting it on social media so that you get that hit of positive emotion again. Mm you know, go back and look at your vacation pictures for the good vacations, yeah. right? And savor that <laughs> right. and be like, remember how great that vacation was? That's savoring. Yeah. And that helps you re-experience that positive emotion again. So that's the second skill. So noticing positive events, savoring. The third skill we usually teach is gratitude, which, and again, you know, these skills overlap to yeah. some extent. So gratitude has a lot in common with noticing positive events it's just more right. about being grateful for things that are or things that happened. Sometimes that has a spiritual component, but it doesn't have to. You can certainly be grateful to other people or just grateful that things happened. You may don't know the cause. And there, you know, there's a lot of work showing that just taking a moment either, you know, daily or once a week to think about things you're grateful for yeah. can have a huge impact on your certainly your psychological well-being, but physical health as well. Yeah. Before we go on to some of the others, just a few comments about those three. One is that like on the daily gratitude journal, I've heard lots of people in recovery talk about how that's a huge practice for them mm -hmm. and where their, their mentors will say, do this every day uh, and what a benefit that is to them. All three of these, it brings me back to something in so many interviews I have with, with people talking about various ways about living well it keeps coming back to attention, it seems like, because all three of those things that you list, recognize a positive event, savor the event, start a gratitude journal, requires a meta habit of paying attention, it right. seems like. Mm -hmm. And that attention uh, seems to be this sort of ingredient that's increasingly difficult for us to get a hold of, given the world of distraction that we live in. Does that, that seem fair to you? Absolutely. And thank you for the lead in to one of our other skills, oh. which is mindful awareness. Oh, uh, okay. When I was initially putting these skills together, I was at the University of California, San Francisco, where they have a really large both public and research program around mindfulness-based stress reduction. So, you know, to this day, they're still doing a lot of mindfulness work. And I was talking to our research director and I was telling him the skills and he's like, well, you're going to include mindfulness. <laughs> and I thought, well... No, because mindfulness is not a positive emotion skill. It's an awareness skill. And I'm going to be working with people experiencing really extreme life stress. And do I really want to make them more aware of their stress? This was my sort of naive yeah. thinking to begin with. But he convinced me, and his name was Rick Hecht, is Rick Hecht. He convinced me that it was worth trying. And I you know, went to the literature that showed that people who 
you know, practice mindfulness, learn mindfulness-based stress reduction, have more positive emotion. So I thought, okay, I'll put that into my program. So we, we do, we, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction is eight sessions, usually hour and a half to two hours a session for, you know, eight weeks. And then there's a day long silent retreat and 45 minutes a day of practice. And it's a lot. And it includes a lot more than the types of the pieces of mindfulness that we focus on. So what we focus on is mindful awareness. So awareness of what's happening, your emotions in particular, but also other things that are going on in your life, experiences, sensations. And then we also focus on the non-judgment piece, which Mm -hmm. is really key, I think, in this program so that you're feeling what you're feeling, you're experiencing what you're experiencing, and you don't judge yourself for it, right? So I'm really glad that that was suggested to me early on, and I'm really glad we included it because anecdotally, it helps enhance the use of the other skills because people are more emotionally aware yeah. and more aware of the positive events going on in their yeah. life, more aware of what they're grateful for. Yeah. So that mindfulness skill and that practice of being more mindful really helps enhance the use of the rest of the skills. Going to take a short break, but coming right up, some more practices for increasing positive emotion in one's own life. Hey friends, you might like a podcast I've been listening to recently called How to Be a Better Human. It's not your average self-improvement podcast. Each week, you can join Chris Duffy in conversation with guests as they seek to uncover sharp insights and give clear takeaways on how you can be a better human. From work to home, from your head to your heart, How to Be a Better Human looks in unexpected places for new ways to improve and show up for one another. It's inspired by the popular series of the same name on Ted's Ideas blog. How to be a better human will help you become a better person from the comfort of your own headphones. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I'm excited to tell you about the history of literature with Jack Wilson. Each week, Jack and his guests explore the most unusual, compelling, and inspiring stories from the world of literature. Always eager, never pretentious. Jack tackles every book as if it could change his life. And more often than not, it seems to do just that. You can start with a recent episode on Shakespeare's first folio with University of Oxford professor Emma Smith, or listen to his conversation with translator Alison Strayer about her experiences with French author Annie Arnaud, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2022. The History of Literature is brought to you by the Podglomerate, New episodes run every Monday and Thursday, and you can listen today by following on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to our show. On non-judgment, I would be interested for you to tell me what you think about this. Recently, well, first I should say that as someone who has had to do a lot of work kind of recovering from a sort of shame-based Bible Belt religious culture in which I could hardly think of anything without self judgment. <laughs> you know, that was right. just like my my constant <laughs> mode of being. Right. You know, was right. self judgment. So I've worked on that and, and thought about that a lot. And you know, I've learned from people like Pima Chodron who who will talk about in doing mindfulness meditation. We'll talk about neither suppress nor indulge. That you observe whatever it is. You don't want to hop on the train mm-hmm. and you don't want to beat yourself up for the train that's coming by, but just note it and let it go uh, look, flow down the stream of one's thoughts and let it go on down. That's been very helpful to me. And recently I heard someone say that, and I, I don't know what I think about this, but it's it's been helpful to me in a practical way. They've suggested that sometimes we will think crazy things because our mind is reminding us of things that we don't want to do. And like I say, I don't know what I think about that, but it's been helpful because I think crazy things sometimes. Yeah. And that sort of permission to frame that as, oh, that's my brain being my friend and just saying, oh, you don't want to do that. 
even yeah. though you may, even though it may put you in the kind of mode of thinking about doing it, it's actually telling me, no, you don't want to do that. I don't know. Right, so that right. sounds crazy at one level, but I don't know. Thoughts about that? Well, I think sort of two things on that. Yeah. The first, the, you know, your mind thinks crazy things that in the, the sort of basic MBSR course, they talk about monkey mind, right? Yeah. yeah. And help people to understand that that's normal. Your mind's going to be all over the place. It right. might be thinking crazy things and then just gently guide your attention back yeah, to yeah. <laughs> your present Some moment sort of sanity, experience, yeah. right? <laughs> so I, I think that understanding that that's how our minds are yeah. is really helpful. And again, not to shame yourself over it. And I think related to that is another one of our skills, which is self-compassion, huh. which is, you know, the understanding that everyone is suffering on some level and you should treat yourself with the same compassion you would treat a good friend. Yeah. So, so many of us are, you know, trained, we're brought up in cultures where there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of guilt, there's a lot of, you know, judging, self-judgment, yeah. right? And self-compassion helps to address that. So, again, so reframing those ideas as, well, if you had a good friend, your best friend was saying these things to themselves, what would you say? Yeah. Like you would say, that's crazy. You're not a bad person. Right. You're not crazy. You're not, you know. So uh, self-compassion, again, was was one of the skills that wasn't initially in our program because Kristen Neff, who's done the most work in self-compassion and has developed an entire program in self-compassion, her work was starting to come online as we were putting this program together. So I didn't know about it until a few years in. And then it, you know, a light bulb went on and I was like, oh, we're teaching self-compassion. Yeah. <laughs> so we made it more explicit. It was always kind of woven in, yeah. but we we make it more explicit yeah. because I think it's really helpful. I'll, I'll note here for listeners that we have, it's one of our most commented on episodes uh, with Kristen. Neff oh, she's and a great. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful episode on self-compassion. Yeah. yeah. What other skills have you working on? So what have I not talked? So my, you talked about mindfulness. One of the more challenging skills for people is positive reappraisal or positive. It's called, sometimes called reframing in sort of mm. the cognitive behavioral sense. I love that. And so what it involves is understanding that your emotional reaction comes from your interpretation or your appraisal of a situation. Yes. So your first appraisal of a situation might be that it's bad and it's very stressful, Positive reappraisals are things like noticing how maybe it wasn't as bad as you initially thought. Another form of positive reappraisal is my personal favorite. It could be worse because mm. I am naturally a sort of a catastrophizer. <laughs> so when something <laughs> bad happens, I can always reappraise it as, oh, this is bad, but it could have been worse, right? So at, ask me any time, any t I can reappraise anything. It, I'm sure it annoys my children in particular, but that sort of idea that, yes, this, this thing is stressful and it's bad, but you know what would have been really bad. And then yeah. you're, you're like, so this is not as bad as that. So therefore, yes. it's not as stressful. <laughs> and the third type of positive reappraisal we talk about is something good that came out of this situation. Mm. So there are different, you know, stress-related growth, post-traumatic growth sort of touches on these things yeah. that even in really awful situations, often there is something good that can come out of it. Yeah. You know, I stop short of trying to tell people that, you know, there, there's always something good in every single thing. That's not true. There yeah. are universally horrific things that we don't need to talk about, but for many things that humans experience, something good comes out of it. Yeah. Even if it was really awful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just that sort of possibility that we do have a certain level of autonomy or there's an element of will to some degree that we can bring to the frame or the interpretation that we choose to prioritize over some given experience. Right. It's a fine line yeah. between saying, you know, you feel the way you feel and that's okay because that's how you feel and also empowering people to know that they have the control and can change their emotional experience. Yeah. 
Another one that I've read that you focus on is recognize and practice small acts of kindness daily. I love that one. Yeah, that's one of my favorites based on work of Elizabeth Dunn, who one of her studies brought in people, you know, brought them into the lab at the beginning of the day and measured how happy they were and then gave everybody $20 and randomly assigned them to go out and spend that money on themselves or on someone else. And then... Although I don't think the participants knew they were going to get a follow-up call. They got a follow-up call at the end of the day and asked how happy they were. And you see where this is going. The people who spent the money on someone else were happier than the people who spent the money on themselves. And it didn't matter what their financial situation was. It was the act of doing something for someone else that led them to be happier. And this has been shown in lots of different ways and in much more sophisticated studies that she's done. But that was sort of the first one where I became aware of this. It's also been shown that, you know, people who volunteer live longer. (laughs) And, you know, again, independent of their own sort of personal resources, it's that it seems to be that act of giving that makes a difference in their well-being. Yeah. I know that just... Personally, anecdotally, and I don't know where I picked it up, but that there are occasions where if I'm in a time of intense stress, if I can remind myself at the beginning of the day simply to be kind, Mm -hmm. it's uh, immense alleviating self-intervention. Yeah, I mean, it gets you out of your own head, right? Right. It's not all about you. You're like, oh, there, here's someone I could do this. You know, I yeah. could buy their coffee and it's not a big deal. But right. to sort of focus on someone else's needs. Yeah, right. <laughs> even just by simply being kind. Yeah. Can make a big difference. Right. Oh, those are all immensely helpful. So as, as we get kind of near the end, uh, could you give us a little bit of commentary about what your research is showing with regard to positive qualitative markers that come as a result of these practices or uh, longevity of life related to these things? Yeah, so we haven't done the study where we randomize people to learn these skills or, you know, do something else and then see if they live longer. That, you know, you have to take that up with the NIH to fund us for that long. (laughs) What we have been able to show is that people who practice these skills are, you know, they have more positive emotion, less depression. We've got some indication that it improves markers of health. Like in people living with HIV, we've shown that people who engage with these skills are more likely to have a suppressed viral load, huh. which kind of blew my mind. That <laughs> I'm like, is... really? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And we've that, that effect has been replicated. So, huh. you know, we don't have an absolutely ironclad, consistent, same findings across every study that we do, but that's kind of the fun of science is that, you know, well, what if we do the, pro- what if we deliver the program online self-guided and what if we do it in people who are depressed and sort of these different nuances and see what works and for whom qualitatively. So, you know, again, this gets a little bit to the anecdotal level, but we not infrequently will have participants in our studies talk about it changing their lives. Mm-hmm which is always amazing. Yeah. Um, so it the program works for the people who do it. So our challenge is to figure out all the ways that we can help people take these skills up as habits. Yeah. Do you all have online a course for people to learn some of these skills? Not at the moment. Okay. We just, we did have an online version that we started during COVID, at the start of COVID, and it came out of people in our department asking us if we could make our program that we were we are still doing with dementia caregivers, if we could make that available to people to cope with yeah. the stress of COVID. And we said, of course. So we, you know, made a copy of it and made it available to, as our sort of friends and family version. And then because I couldn't help myself, I got an you know, human subjects approval and put some questionnaires in. So we we did have a, a version available sort of nationwide. Anyone over 18 with an internet connection could do it, you know, and they'd fill out some questionnaires yeah. for us. And we showed that that was effective for the people who did it. Again, we just closed that one down. Hmm. So we don't have it available at the moment. There are other, there are, you know, companies, uh, there's one called It's All Good Here that has similar forms. And in fact, I've worked with them and they have a version of our intervention. Okay that is available. 
Capify is another company that mm. does this. Mm. And again, they're not, it's not rocket science. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to pay a company to do it or you don't have to yeah. enroll in a in a study. You can you can try these out for yourself, you know, try to keep a gratitude right. journal for a few weeks and see how you feel. Yeah. So yeah. those kind of things are are pretty easy to take up if you, you know, ha- have the motivation right. to give it a try. I've been talking to Professor Judith Moskowitz, Professor of Medical Social Sciences at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Judy, thanks so much for your time today, your generosity, and uh, your good work and sharing your, your work with us today. Thank you. I always love talking about it, so I appreciate you coming down here. Thanks so much. You've been listening to No Small Endeavor and our interview with Professor Judith Moskowitz. We gratefully acknowledge the support of Lilly Endowment Incorporated, a private philanthropic foundation supporting the causes of community development, education, and religion, and the support of the John Templeton Foundation, whose vision is to become a global catalyst for discoveries that contribute to human flourishing. Thanks to all the Stellar team that makes this show possible. Christy Bragg, Jacob Lewis, Sophie Byard, Tom Anderson, Kate Hayes, Mary Evelyn Brown, Carriot Harmon, Jason Sheasley, Ellis Osborne, and Tim Lauer. Thanks for listening, and let's keep exploring what it means to live a good life together. No Small Endeavor is distributed by PRX and is a production of Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studio. Oh.